After what I'd charitably describe as an aggressive amount of requests for my thoughts on this particular Sentai season, we finally arrived. So hopefully this review, analysis, essay, breakdown, whatever you want to call it, ends up living to what I imagine are some hefty expectations. We set the table a fair bit through our conversations about the Ghost Age or crossover movie, so now we can really dig into the meat of this story and the various characters within it. If you haven't seen that first video yet, I'd recommend it mainly because I think it's a pretty neat video, but also because that's where I really get into a lot of the background elements of this anniversary season, and how the film spoke and spoke well to a lot of that, right down to how they incorporate the ones that started it all. So if you're big on this season and haven't seen it yet, you should probably watch it solely for that reason, but you really won't need it to understand anything I plan to follow up on here. With all that said, let's take a closer look at how Gokaidra works. So, the team of five going on six rangers we see here are searching for this mystical greatest treasure in the universe. We touched on this last time, but both the ranger keys and said earth-based treasure are directly connected to the aftermath of the Great Legend War. But complications ensue as our 35th Sentai team is charged with, however reluctantly, dealing with a renewed Zangyak threat. They happen to be the same threat the combined forces of all the past Sentai just barely managed to stave off, and accomplishing that cost all of them the full extent of their powers. And while this team can access most of those powers by way of the Ranger Keys right from the jump, sans the ones yet to be claimed, the full power of any given set is only activated when they are deemed worthy of receiving it. This last part many a time proves to be particularly challenging for a team of space pirates who were initially presented as both ambivalent to the plight of Earth and the virtues the Sentai alumnus are meant to embody. The fact that I've completed the series means I not only know where this comes from, but how it plays out as the episode count gets higher. But that does make the rather shaky by design foundation far more interesting to look back on. I think we're meant to be a bit wary of this Captain Marvelous led team at first, where their priorities don't seem especially aligned with what you'd see out of a standard Sentai of the time. Many of the people they interact with know that, and the Sentai alums they meet definitely know that. The most interesting examples of this occur in various forms to me, and while I don't have something of note to say about each and every cameo and what they communicate, we'll inevitably highlight a lot of them, but I definitely want to discuss the first three tribute episodes because I think they all highlight both the highs and the lows of how I perceive this opening run of episodes. Episode 3 gives us the True to Form Magi Ranger tribute after Episode 2 sets events into motion. I say this having seen him for the very first time in this episode, just a note, but I wasn't especially enamored by the idea of Magi Red's entire character being reduced to what amounts to a rather basic platitude, especially since the nebulous idea of having courage wouldn't be something particular to any one team anyway. But what was curious about this episode, and what I kind of liked about it, is how over the course of it, Marv is shouting all of this advice at Doc about what he has to be and has to do, and Doc only ends up earning their first legendary power by way of not exactly following it. Sure, he does end up embodying courage, but there is this clearly observable disconnect between the physics problem he solves in the heat of the moment versus Marv just straight up running through fire. So I ended up liking it as an early character beat for my second favorite here, or maybe third Luca makes things complicated, but we'll save that for later. But despite liking it, I ended up feeling conflicted as to how we're meant to interpret the alleged badassery of Marvelous here, especially when so many episodes after this one, and the two before it, frame it much more matter-of-factly, even when it really shouldn't be. And I'm going a bit out of order here, but this does naturally feed into the Geki Ranger tribute more than the Decker Ranger one, so we'll go there first. Because it's there, where we once more feed into this very evident sense of separation between the Gokais who are really about that life, and the pair who at first glance seem to have been dragged along for the ride. Granted, that is kind of what happens to Doc, but we'll get there too. It's at this point where the show doesn't simply play into this palpable difference for comedic effect, but rather uses it as a means of Doc and I am recognizing how they can become more useful to their team. 
putting aside for just a second how invaluable their baseline contributions already proved to be throughout proceedings, the sentiment is a nice one because it comes directly from them as opposed to something the other three insist on. But where I become mixed on it overall is how it does very little for Marv, Joe, and Luca in terms of embracing a similar kind of what more could I be doing perspective. After all, Doc does the cleaning, cooking, and tech support, and without I'm, everyone on this ship would have killed each other already. So it's odd that both of these lovable goobers bettering themselves for the sake of the whole doesn't evoke much introspection from the others. And normally, this combination of things, and how consistently it's insisted upon, would bother me more, but that's just the thing. Looking back at it, it's hard to get the sense that we're meant to buy into the incongruity of some of the actions taken by several of these characters. This show largely commits to the show we nature of what their perspectives bring, even prior to really digging into the backstories, and yet, the pathway towards actually earning a legendary power goes through Doc and or I'm a fair amount of the time, and when Guy arrives, who both already comes preloaded with a trio of powers himself and fits more into the Doc slash I'm mold, a lot of episodes do not work without his unique take on matters, and that's despite me not being too taken with Guy overall, but the ideas were there. Gokaiger likes what Marv and Joe bring to the battlefield, and they certainly like getting the most out of Maoichi Michi in a role that feels like second nature to her. But what the show communicates just as fervently, even when it's less obvious based on how the others respond to it, is how vital their contributions also are. The writers must have understood this, which not only explains the aforementioned earning of several powers, but how the show also leans into what that really says about the team over time. And this is why as the show progresses, we see these subtle, before turning prominent, shifts in how the characters interact and treat each other. You know you're finally getting through that cold, thick wall of understandable distrust when Aim can go a whole 22 minutes without explaining away the more caustic traits of her pirate family. That having been said, I do think it's a bit odd to not have an entire law enforcement agency tag these pirates for being wanted criminals for a little bit longer. And I'm not just saying that because it would mean more Jasmine, though I'm not not saying that, but that aside, I think there's something to be said about how all of this could have related back to the Zangyak, because the reason I personally thought Kruger and friends chasing around these young whippersnappers would be cool is because as a police force for part of the universe, they would to some degree be subservient to the royal family that rules over said universe, which in turn would give them cause to pause about their place in law enforcement and if it's really helping the people that need it most right now, a la Keichiro many years later, but without that same level of cosmic oversight, since the ganglers are not themselves the law of the land, but also work outside of it. This is all admittedly somewhat tangential and not something that we reasonably could have expected from a season that operates the way Gokaiger does, but it's also one of the only legacy plotlines that could have elicited a type of conflict I'd find more interesting, since Lupat didn't exist yet. But seeing as how it does exist now and is still probably my favorite Sentai season, I'm just going to headcanon this as the prototype for their basic story premise. Which, by the by, might not even be that much of a stretch seeing as how Lupat's head writer, Junko Kimura, was involved in much of Gokaiger's writing as well, though not this episode specifically. That was fittingly done by head writer Naruhisa Arakawa, who also was the main writing force behind Deca Ranger itself. This is sort of a tangent of a tangent, but I promise this is actually going to bring us back on track as a prelude of sorts into the character breakdowns during part 2 because this video would not feel complete without taking a bit more time to highlight Kimura's writing for this season. Episode 15, Bosco's arrival and Marv's need to confront what his return means. Episode 23, Luca and Aim's big combo episode that peels some layers off both of them. And Episode 7, the Geki Ranger tribute we just talked about that sets the stage for future developments in some not so obvious ways. She was responsible for tackling all of that to say nothing of episodes 30 and 39, the sooner revolving around Joe being forced to open up again through his Bizorg conflict, and the latter being among my favorite episodes of Gokaiger period. I swear this isn't just a roundabout way of saying that her being the head writer of Lupat elevated that season far higher than it might have been otherwise, 
though in my opinion that is true and I am saying that, but what I'm also saying, returning our focus to Gokaiju specifically, is I think there's something to be said for how much she really, really gets these characters as people, and how much she demands we invest in them as emotionally fragile beings of tragic circumstance. And even when it gets far more absurd than usual during the Goanger tribute, the case can be made that it's still present, but in a way that leans more into her comedic chops, since while she didn't write much for Goanger proper, though the pair of Goanger things she was involved with also featured Arakawa, she did partner up with Arakawa again to lend her penmanship to Akiba Ranger, the far, far different anniversary-ish unofficial Sentai season. Now, this isn't to imply that Arakawa is worse at this, far from it. He wrote 41 after all, Aim's big moment and the episode that is more than likely my favorite of the bunch. If I'm saying anything at all, it's that both of their skills combined congealed in a nice way to make solid use out of nearly every character present. Okay, okay, but while we're talking about writers, allow me just one more tangent. This is still about Gokaiju though, so it only half counts. The talk around those that return to lend their talents to this season is so often focused on, and not without purpose, the actors and highlighting their roles of yesteryear. But the writer's room also brought back their own old school hero in Yoshio Urasawa. He was notably the head writer for Car Ranger at a time when Sentai wasn't expected to be so aggressively comedic, and he wound up writing both the Car Ranger tribute episode as well as the episode that follows up on the events thereof. Both are amazing, the first one in particular being an early highlight before the season really started clicking for me on a more full-time basis. It's just this wild sequence of events that just have to be seen to be believed. And it all caps off in part two, with an overbearing reformed xenophobic mother marrying an alien who was introduced initially as the jealous lover. They even throw in a Power Rangers joke with regards to the Turbo Ranger powers, which was cute and it adds further legitimacy to the widely known, though not as widely believed, notion that PR and Sentai's legacies aren't mutually exclusive, and haven't been since the 90s. Even Taro Sakamoto, not the Sakamoto you're thinking of, who directed both Car Ranger episodes here, also directed several Wild Force episodes back in the day. And just that side of production could devolve into a whole other tangent, but I digress. In watching these episodes, you can really feel Urasawa's writing sensibilities tugging quite a bit at how an otherwise normal Gokaiju plot would function, but not in ways that I think harm the characters at all. And part of that is having so much of the plot revolve around the side characters as opposed to the main cast, focusing more on Jalesto and his various interactions while our heroes serve more as bystanders to the beautiful madness. And just based on my default media tastes, I'm almost always going to favor a story where the monster of the week, or two different weeks in his case, gets to exhibit a mindset deep enough that he's forced to reconsider the world around him, and in turn, others are forced to reconsider him. It's an out-and-out -out comedic farce first and foremost, but it still possesses a lot more commitment to what its wacky end product means and says than a lot of toku that would have taken this far more seriously. And even though the Zangyak aren't really the first villains you think of when it comes to that form of characterization, I came away from this show believing that even within their main assortment of players, there is a little more to it on the individual level, even if their broad strokes conflict is relatively straightforward. And now that you've all humored me enough to let me geek out over how the writing room created various types of high points in this season, let's talk a little bit more about this season's conflict. One of my main questions coming into this season was what the Zangyak's villainy would mean to the story, which would beg the question of why any of these Gokaijers would want to become pirates. It's an interesting setup in a very early PR sort of way. What I mean by that is the Zangyak are defined by their endless conquest and control of other star systems, to the point where Earth is just another backwater planet to them. That should sound very familiar to MMPR watchers, though here, even the Gokaijers initially think of Earth in a fairly similar way. More interesting still is seeing how they wrote about the impossibly massive influence on the universe the Zangyak lay claim to. You'll notice that the only currency our heroes reference prior to coming to Earth is the one their enemies instilled on the universe, which is a neat touch, 
even while trying to fight against the system of power that has oppressed trillions, they still need to think about value in the form of Zagan, but also, it's worth digging into how they adapted some of that conceptually, since we can. In Gokaiger, we understand that the various backstories of the cast connect them to the threat at hand, which in turn leads them to Earth to fight against these planetary subjugators. We've talked before about how this finds a way to connect back to Gorenger, however loosely, but then thinking about Super Megaforce gives us a connection that feels arguably more organic when viewed through the lens of MMPR, since War's Gil becomes Prince Vicar, who feels more in line with Rita Repulsa as a spoiled, rotten heir to an impossibly evil father, and both are fighting far more happy-go-lucky children who are trying to pay it forward despite not having a terrible life circumstance to fight through. So the big difference here, as I see it, is how the Zangyak are a bit more ideological with their anniversary connection than the Armada, even if not all the ideas survive that transition. The Armada, in turn, are a bit more literal, but the concepts line up more all while housed in a season far closer in tone and focus to MMPR than comparing Go Kaiger to Go Renger. This isn't to say that the Armada are better overall, I don't think they are for reasons we'll get into in part 3, but it's interesting seeing how both factions need to serve the big legacy celebration mandates, but despite being equivalent in most ways, both operate vastly differently in their own context when thinking about how each of these two franchises started. But getting back to just Go Kaiger, now that we understand the power the Zangyak hold, we're led to our question about piracy. Now, the actual answer is very complex and is rooted in centuries upon centuries of history regarding how many countries and many cultures have defined pirates, buccaneers, privateers, etc, etc. To say nothing of the much more recent, relatively speaking, and only somewhat accurate romanticization of the golden age of piracy that, after several attempts and almost as many misses, led to the most successful pirate thing ever made, and in the years that followed it would come to play second fiddle to the now most successful pirate thing ever made, which in turn ended up being the most clear influence on the conceptualization of the Gokaijers as a crew. Now, I'm not a One Piece guy myself, just a note, I've seen plenty of episodes in several of their movies, somehow, and tried to catch up two or three times but failed spectacularly. Nothing against the show itself or its army of fans, and for what it's worth, the Hosoda movie is genuinely great, as are all Hosoda movies but for another day. With that said, I think the argument regarding the legitimacy of Gokaiger's ideas on piracy, assuming it even needs to legitimately speak to said ideas, presents a tricky motif for a couple of reasons. On the one hand, the history of piracy beyond the more glamorous, swashbuckling side depicts a group of people starved of financial opportunities elsewhere. While not the exclusive motivating factor, it's one of the key things about pirates that has remained true throughout the centuries and through till today. And taken from that angle, it's easy to see how Gokaiger's characters view such methods as necessary because of their lack of recourse otherwise. Their economies were destabilized, their homes were taken from them, and the one guy here who tried to align himself with the Zangyak regretted that move pretty quickly. And all for the sake of a foreign power installing their own system that seems to all but ensure inequity except among the very elite. Even the idea of Bosco as a privateer, or Corsair as they're also called, for the Zangyak Empire as a legal distinction from, but exceedingly similar to, our protags has deep historical foundations. The Zangyak being an empire specifically is probably not a coincidence to that end, as the Ottoman and Spanish empires of yesteryear gained a lot from utilizing similar methods in the 15 and 1600s. On the other hand, however, I think you make a stronger case for the legitimacy of their space pirate status by investing, at all, in the rather non-existent collateral damage created in their need to survive. And I think there exists a major difference between just being kind of mean and pushy sometimes versus justifying doing reprehensible things because you feel like you have to. Or, if the show isn't willing to compromise their fluffier ideas because this season, of all seasons, isn't the time to have more morally questionable heroes, that's fine. But I think the season also half-bakes that type of idea, when you have Bosco dishing out throwaway implications like Akka Red isn't the man you think he is, a line that Marv simply ignores and moves on rather quickly from anyway. As is, 
Aka Red's overall involvement is so jarringly unimportant despite feeling so important that I barely brought him up over the course of writing all the parts of this review, when really, that was their chance to say something to round out Bosco's betrayal, and Aka Red still gets to walk off into the sunset as this mythic father figure to Marv, which is perfectly fine to be clear, but it does undermine other potentially more interesting ideas the writing clearly flirted with but didn't want to be married to. But on the other other hand, behind all the rum and the scurvy, piracy was first and foremost a pretty shrewd business practice, which is part of why it's easy to appreciate Luca's stance on it. Her being, I would say, the most authentic pirate of the bunch, insofar as she can be, I think ends up making a huge difference on proceedings. A lot of seasons might have been content to frame her materialistic nature in the most vapid of ways, but we know that she knows the value of what proper finances bring, and more to the point, she also knows how nigh insurmountable the cost of not having that type of security is. So even though the show doesn't have the time to dig into some of the more logistical ideas that might have made the Zangyak an even better fit as an antagonizing force against pirates, the implied ideas do carry some weight. All this to say, Somewhere in between the true essence of piratehood and what various forms of media and literature have turned pirates into lies this motley crew, and even though they definitely lean more Jack Sparrow or Luffy than Captain Kidd or Black Sam Bellamy, there is a truth to many of their struggles that cannot be dismissed out of hand, despite the demographics it needs to speak to. And for a season that has to serve as many masters as Gokaiger does, I didn't even expect to get that going in. But despite the hard cap on how far they take this motif, it would have been interesting to see more examples of how the Zangyak's desecration of entire worlds and cultures gave rise to planetary colonies forced to abide by their standards. And it would have been even more interesting had they tried to hone in on how the Gill family amassed all this power while a different form of royalty occupies a spot on the team. Now make no mistake, I'm immediately strikes you as the antithesis of the Zangyak prince, and never fails to prove that, which was likely the point of her being a princess. But there's also so much we don't know about Famille beyond a handful of anecdotes, so it's curious that this isn't a more forward-facing part of the story. And that isn't even to say that the story would necessarily be improved with that added focus, though it's possible, because there still exists an undercurrent pushing the story forward that speaks to how both the prince and princess work in their most telling moments. That's what I'd consider the heart of this review, and really the heart of Gokaiger in general, so we'll cover all of that in parts 2 and 3. I'll try my best to get that out in a reasonable time so the end card of this video shows part 2 and not whatever random video I've thrown on there to fill the space. And until then, thanks for watching.